Welcome to Deep Pockets by Petra Söderling, a conversation about governments, technologies, and innovation. The ongoing season, Winter 2023, is loosely based on my upcoming book, Governments and Innovation, The Economic Developer's Guide to Our Future. The book will be available for purchase in Amazon during Q1 2023. Our theme song is by New Orleans jazz icon Leroy Jones. Hi everyone and buckle up because today we'll be skyrocketing towards outer space. The space industry is one of the topics in my book Governments and Innovation as an example of government initiated and led private business. Space technology is fascinating theme because it enables so many other industries, starting from satellite-based navigation, data communication, agriculture, logistics, mining, weather prediction, forest fire, mitigation, tracking of climate change, etc., etc. Things you wouldn't immediately associate with space. It's also a field of competition between countries. Many of us remember how the space race began uh, during Cold War, and how it was a show of muscle flexing for the superpowers at the time. On the other hand, countries also work together to do research and explore what is still very much unknown space, and try to come up with answers to fundamental questions like, uh, how come we're all here? Why do we exist? In the studio today, I have Arfin Chaudhry, former international director of the UK Space Agency, and who now works as the Vice President for the Saudi Space Commission. He has a BA from the University of London and has also studied at the Royal College of Defence Studies. Also interesting to our theme, Arfin has been a mentor and a coach at the UK Civil Service for over 14 years, coaching civil servants and students and building his own experience on the public-private sector partnerships as well as academic networks. Welcome to Deep Pocket. Thank you very much, Petra. And I'm delighted to be joining you for this podcast. I think you've summarized it really well in terms of what's happening in the space sector and the space community. And from my perspective, the size, the scope, the pace of developments in the space community at the moment is immense. And now is the time to be in the space sector. And it's a fascinating place to be working. And throughout the course of this podcast, I'll share with you my own experiences and my intent and ambition and enthusiasm and excitement for the sector. Wonderful. I can't wait. But before we get there, I'm curious, how did you end up working with space Like from early on? Is it something that was your childhood dream? Did you have a telescope or did you read sci-fi comics that took place in space? Tell us So um, I'm happened. probably going to reveal my age when I give you the context of some of the programs I used to watch and the TV programs such as Space 1999, so the early editions mm-hmm. of Star Trek. My elder brother, who was, you know, a young boy when the space land, the moon landing happened, uh, shares all of that enthusiasm. I was a little bit too young for all of that. But I do remember the Apollo program growing up and seeing those vivid images and the photography that, you know, you look at the, the, the sights of the Earth from the moon and those particularly uh, amazing backdrops. Uh, my brother did have a telescope, my elder brother, and occasionally he would let his younger brother use the telescope. Oh. Uh, not that often, but uh, it, oh, there we go. it was a really exciting time. And as I say, I've built that enthusiasm. I've worked, as I say, as an accountant um, in the public sector in the UK, in the areas of defense, security, cyber, and then space. That journey, I think, has been a gradual one. And it makes logical sense. But my key role in the UK Space Agency, as I mentioned, was international director. And delete the word space, insert defense, security, cyber. It doesn't make any difference, really. But one of the things that has really enthused me about the space sector in the last few years that I've been heavily involved in it is the enthusiasm, the engagement of the sector, but also not just the industry, but also academia as well. And seeing that close relationship between industry, academia and government has been fascinating. And I'll say a little bit more later on about the international dimension of that, the the global nature of space. Yeah, that's actually, uh, that's a great segue to my next question. And, and thank you for the background. That is truly 
exciting. So as I mentioned in the, the intro, space is, is everywhere. It's vital to us because most of our data communications, the GPS and other everyday services, they operate from space, even though we don't always realize that. Um, and it's often referred to as the unknown if we think of space exploration, for example. Now, to set the global scene, the international scene for our discussion, can you tell us something about the various space programs around the world? Uh, NASA is probably the biggest, probably with most money as well. Europe has ESA program. China is doing something. Um, tell us who else is there and what okay, are these guys so doing? Okay, so great question. So thank you very much for that. I'm probably going to start with the first one you mentioned there, NASA, and my own personal experience when I was at the UK Space Agency working with NASA colleagues and State Department colleagues alongside a number of key partners in developing the Artemis program. And specifically, it's worth adding that the Artemis program, it's Artemis is the twin sister of Apollo. And when you look at the Artemis program and the Artemis mission, the plan is to get uh, the next man of color and the first woman on the lunar surface. And, you know, it's that's the kind of ambition, scale and development. And I can talk to my children and my daughter about those. Um, and specifically my daughter about those. So the Artemis program is a big one for their, from the NASA perspective, but it's worth highlighting that they went into collaboration with other space-faring nations. So it's important to recognize that even NASA, some of those areas, they can do it, but in the future, they can't do it alone. There are skill sets and expertise from all over the world. So the countries that have signed up to the Artemis Accords are already helping develop some of that capability. Countries such as Italy, Countries such as uh, Japan, Luxembourg, the UK, Canada, Australia, all involved in some way or another, either directly or indirectly in the supply chain or the development of technology and capability. The other one is China, from my perspective. It's worth noting that the Chang'e program and the ambition that they've already identified, particularly with their International Space Station and the work that they've done. Um, the others I'll talk about in some detail, our own UK program. Um, obviously, the launch capability, both vertical and horizontal, the ambition to look at areas of expertise, particularly in terms of deep space communications. And I, I think it was a, a program earlier on this week on the Radio 4 in the UK, where one of the, the directors of the UK Space Agency talked about effectively Internet for the Moon. Those are the kind of impressive scales and ambitions hmm. of things that we're talking about. But then also, you've got many uh, other spacefaring nations that we have a good and strong close collaboration with, either in my role in Saudi Space Commission, but also when I was at UK Space Agency. When you look at uh, Japan, Singapore, India, there are over 100 countries that have space agencies. Uh, you know, and I'd defy a member. I'd defy oh. a member of the public to name more than five of them or ten, um, and it is just incredible because currently we're working with several countries uh, in the Middle East, and you just look at the work that's being done now, the size, scale, level of ambition. Uh, the the Saudi Space Commission has identified the work of the Bahraini Space uh, Science Agency, and then obviously the UAE Space Agency. So that's just the Middle East. So the scale and opportunity is significant. Um, and I think, again, just reiterating the exciting prospects, but it's worth adding as well that many of them are doing it in partnership and collaboration. And a good example of that is the Artemis Cords. Originally, there were seven signatories. I think now, I'll need to check, but I think there's something like over 30 countries now that have signed up to the Accords. So I think that's a great example of collaboration and partnership. Thanks. I, I have to add that um, the internet on moon, the 5G network, tel telecom network, will be provided by my former uh, employer. Nokia, so, so thank you very much for that advertising push there. But again, it's just fascinating. For example, I've been working with colleagues at an organization called the Science Technology Facilities Council. And some of the programs of work that they've been identifying, like, uh, you know, a testing for water at the end of a drill bit on the lunar surface. I just don't understand the technology. How could you do that? How do you weigh um, lunar matter in a weightless environment? So the technology is it, beyond my level of um, understanding or appreciation. But there are some incredible scientists and members of the academic community that have been engaged in these wonderful programs. Yeah, and a lot of this research then spills over to other fields here on Earth. We have a lot of technologies already that uh, benefit from the space program starting from the 1960s, uh, which is actually um, 
another great segue uh, to my next next question is uh, a lot of these programs are publicly funded by you mentioned over a hundred countries have programs and it's the taxpayers who are paying for this stuff. Uh, so, like, can you give us a sense how the Joe Average in America or Mr. Smith in the UK, how are these taxpayers getting return for these investments? Again, a great made? question. And clearly, we've, now, we've not rehearsed or segued all of these, but it's interesting that the questions have a logical flow. <laughs> yeah. I think the first thing I'd say is somewhat simplistic. If you turn space off with the satellites and everything else that we've got going, we're talking about bank transfers, we're talking about ATM machines, we're talking about mobile phones, we're talking about weather forecasting, we're talking about traffic reports, GPS, position navigating timing, all of those aspects you wouldn't be able to do. And when you look at some of the natural disasters that have happened, and you know we could talk about the, 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 um, the, the war in Ukraine and the, the invasion, So the challenge we've got there is space-enabled technologies and capabilities. How can they help uh, humanity, mankind? And those technologies and those capabilities have been used for for the good. That said, it's clear to see that over a period of time, space has been coming has become more industrial, more in, uh, commercial in that respect. Although you you're right, fair to say, it's probably a, a billionaire's paradise at the moment, but. It's expanding and it's becoming more economical. Um, I, again, I was listening to a program. You know, when you look at the air, air transport, uh, um, plane travel, you know, it was exclusive for the rich uh, many, many years ago, and then it's become more commercial and then opened up. We're expecting to see that from the space community, and you'll see space tourism as another wow. area that's been identified, and a number of companies and countries are involved in identifying spaceports for both um, vertical as well as uh, horizontal launch. So those are really crucial. So there are benefits, but I think it's also fair to say that clearly, yes, government investment is the initial catalyst, but we're seeing in low Earth and geo-orbit the increased commercialization Whereas the governments, particularly when you look at both NASA from the U.S. side and, and uh, CNSA, the Chinese National Space Agency from China, and others, are looking to the lunar surface and beyond to Mars. And again, the Artemis program, which is, looks at the moon and Mars as part of their ambition and intent. So I think there's an area for cooperation between industry and academia. There's a, a, I absolutely agree there's a role there for government in terms of support and investment, but there's also a role there for government in terms of providing the right conditions, the environment, the context. And I'll try not to bore the audience too much, but also ensuring that the regulatory environment is right. And that's an important aspect because we are all, dare I say it, responsible actors in space. And perhaps, you know, later on in this call, uh, we'll say a little bit more about the whole issue about the UN Sustainable Development Goals and active debris removal uh, and space junk. I'll stop there, but I'm sure you've got lots of other follow-ups to that, Petra. I was just going to ask about that, so I'm glad. you. Uh, I'll let you return to that uh, later when when you're ready. You mentioned Ukraine I have followed the the war from my home in Colorado, and uh, many of the n- news channels on TV they use extremely high quality satellite images. Actually, often by our local space company here, Maxar. Uh, you know, these images are from the ground in Ukraine. It shows the destruction, or we're even seeing on TV Russian equipment, which is kind of amazing. And these I- images are extremely sharp and you know high quality. So defense, how do you see the strategic importance of using space for defense purposes? And I'm guessing you're going to say it's very important, of course. Um, But I was going to ask, what if you're a very small country? And, you know, I checked beforehand, we have uh, listeners from countries like Vietnam, Peru, Singapore, Monaco. But you just you did mention Luxembourg is active and over 100 countries have their own programs. But should these countries, you know, if they don't have the budgets that NASA has or the Chinese government has, should they be worried in terms of defense? What think they, what can they do to keep up with the technology? Again, a good question, Petra. I think space by default is dual in nature, civil and military. Um, through my career thus far in the space community and the space sector, it's been very much focused on civil space. If I use my example from the UK for uh, for, for that example specifically, 
the UK's national space strategy, obviously the Ministry of Defence developed their defence capability and strategy, but they work in partnership and collaboration because there are companies that are involved in developing space capability on behalf of defence, but there is a natural crossover to the civil side of the house as well. And I think it's beholden on us to be, and I referred to it in my earlier answer, responsible actors in space. And there are a number of opportunities in international body, particularly the UN and the Office for Outer Space Affairs, UNUSA, that provides that kind of role. I think it's beholden on all of us. The we, we it's it, we can't get away from it. Space is dual, civil and military. But I think what we need to be able to demonstrate is that we are responsible actors. Use the fora of UNUSA and others to develop that. And again, we're linked certainly from the UK and my experience when I was at the UK Space Agency, working very closely with the Office for Outer Space Affairs on the development of space sustainability and active debris removal. So responsible actors in space, but also recognizing that that level of cooperation exists in many uh, countries between their civil and military structures. And the UK, for example, has now set up its own um, the space command structure, very similar to the US model. And that's worth noting as well, because my, from my perspective, it, it has to operate in cooperation and we have to be mutually aware of each other's capabilities. But there will be elements of each country that will consider space from a military as well as a civil perspective. Um, just out of curiosity, just before this recording, uh, I went for a run and I listened to a GovTech podcast where they talked about how FCC and NASA are jointly, uh, you know, setting up regulations for uh, debris in the orbit. Do you see that all of the work that America and other big countries are doing, is that uh, to the benefit of the United Nations and everyone? Or is it something that the US is doing on their own? What's your... I'm going to try not to be too mischievous um, in responding to that question. I think... There is a recognition that it's, it's a responsibility for all of us, space junk or whatever you want to call it, space debris, and the collection and the maintenance. And again, the regulatory environment you know, that we're now agreeing and hopefully setting up consistent standards across the world. Um, what I want to see is a regulatory environment that is not a race to the bottom. My challenge is, in that respect, if you leave it, and it sounds somewhat flippant, but if you left it to government to provide the regulatory environment, it would probably be 500 pages thick. If you left it to industry at an extreme, it would be one page. What it needs is a dialogue between industry and government to come to a shared view and assessment on the sustainable aspects of space. And we have it same through the UK. I remember when I was in my early roles in the UK MOD, we have the CADMID cycle, sort of cradle to grave. So managing that full process and being responsible actors for when satellites or that space junkie is no longer in service, how is it then actively or responsibly disposed of? So it's important that we all work together and there are consistent lines. Clearly, there are commercial economic advantages, but that's not to say, and I would challenge anyone who says more regulation equals more cost, because that's not necessarily my understanding. Yeah. Um, for my book, you suggested that I talk to a gentleman from Italy called Luca Rossettini, uh, and I did. Uh, he's founded a startup called Deorbit, and what he is doing is he's enabling the space junk to be recycled and reused in space to build new satellites and, and, you know, new equipment in space. And, and his analogy was that you don't build a ship in the middle of the desert and then take it to the ocean. You build the ship right next to the ocean. So thanks for the tip. It was a wonderful conversation. Um, so I hope uh, people here will be buying my book and reading that chapter. But let's talk more about private. Uh, the new space economy and even the old space economy, it's really booming as you said, we have new launching companies, SpaceX, Blue Origin, Virgin, Rocket Labs. These are all companies that are making headlines, and we love to see their famous founders shoot up to space and grin on TV. But there's a whole adjacent industry that's building and supporting the rockets, the launchers, the satellites, the radio communications equipment, so data, creating and managing that AI graphics, you name it. 
Where do you see the biggest commercial opportunities for companies right now? Again, fascinating question. I'm going to break that down, if I may, into a couple of key points. The key areas, I think, are, are twofold. Exploration and comms, as I talked about earlier, and then clearly the downstream activity. That's where if you do the analysis of the uh, space sector and the market, where is the real return or the investment return? It's probably certainly in the downstream activity. That said, so that's the first one, exploration, comms, and downstream activity. The other point I'd make, and again, I think I said it earlier in the in the podcast, is that government don't provide the growth. We, we set the environment, the conditions, and there'll be certain contracts for work or whatever. But that's not even as a customer, you don't think? As as a yeah, I agree to an extent as a customer, but that as a proportion, well, Put it this way, you remember, we were too young then, but remember the moon landing. What percentage of U.S. GDP NASA was spending for the moon launch? It was nearly 5%. You look at where that is now, it's dropped quite significantly. But again, it's a recognition that we're able to do, my old sort of civil service phrase, more with less in terms of the public sector as driving, driving the catalyst and I'd refer to it as a catalyst rather than anything else. And I think Luca was very right about his analogy. And again, a great a deorbit. I'm not going to go too much, but a great company and some of the technology and the capability they develop. But you're right as a catalyst. But the growth and the innovation comes from the sector, industry, academia. We help provide that catalyst. We also help provide the conditions and the environment under which that can thrive. And I'll give you an example. Obviously, the, we've got organizations such as DARPA with the sort of defense side of the house in the U.S. But the U.K. has just developed an organization called ARIA, which is something similar, cutting edge technology and developing that at a quick pace, hopefully removing some of the bureaucratic civil services and everything else on the processes, being much quicker to market, so to speak, in terms of the capability. So developing the environment, the ecosystem that that can develop, that work under. The whole space ecosystem, that said, is fascinating. It covers everything from the skills agenda. I'm an accountant by profession, but I'm in the space sector. Um, You know, there are the range of professions and the skills that are involved in the space community, in the space environment. It's fascinating. So you have the skills agenda. You have, you know, driving that growth. You have supply chain, and it's a global supply chain. And, you know, from your previous experience, Petra, you will know what that means. Uh, It is a genuinely global supply chain. Developing those key expertise and those key capabilities, and crucially, it's done through partnering and collaboration. So that goes back to the roles I had both in the UK Space Agency as the international director, but then more crucially in my role at the moment as the, the, the vice president for strategy and partnership within the Saudi Space Commission has three key areas. One is working towards the implementation of the national space strategy. The second one, when that's formally published and announced, the second one is working with industry and academia, both nationally and internationally, globally. And then the third one is those strategic partnerships with fellow space agencies across the globe. And I've mentioned some of those already. All of that links into there are many companies that would not necessarily see themselves as space companies, but much of their, their the capability is driven through space. And so upstream, downstream activities are crucial in that. And then I don't even need to bore you with the size and scale of the space market and what it's likely to be in the coming decade. It really is an exciting time for governments, for industry, for academia, and the areas I'm seeing as space exploration. You know, and I, you know, my daughter in a few years' time, hopefully, will see the first woman land on the moon, walk footsteps on the moon so those are the kind of things and just think of what that did for a generation back in the 60s and the early 70s and it's doing again now those are the key aspects for me so insightful and inspiring as we um, wrap up this is my last question um so two things what does the future hold for space and what are the most urgent things we as humans living on planet earth should be focusing on so in that respect i think i would say the first thing is again repeating my last comments uh, it, it really is an exciting i think this next 
decade. And my earlier comment, the introduction, we're at we're, space. We're at the right time, right place to be in this sector, this environment. So I think all of that, uh, the, the, the up arrows, so to speak, I think the really exciting part is the space exploration and what that means for humanity in, in terms of that. Oh. But in terms of on Earth, the one word would be sustainability. And for us, there is the space-enabled technology that helps support the whole ecosystem and development of sustainability on Earth is incredible. It would probably be a separate podcast and probably someone more educated, more informed than I, to talk about the issues about space-enabled technology and how they're supporting uh, humanity and mankind, humankind on uh, the whole issue of sustainability on Earth. There we have it. Thank you, Arthur and Chaudhry, for visiting the Pockets podcast. Uh, Petra, can I just say it's been an absolute delight. Thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to meeting you in person one time, although I, you know, I'm planning to be at Space Symposium in Colorado uh, later this year. And then also, obviously, at IAC Baku. Again, two great space events. You get all the right people at the right time, at the right place. And as I say, um, I remain as enthused about the space sector and the space community and the engagement as I did dare I say it, six, seven years ago when I joined the UK Space Agency. And it's a fantastic environment, a great sector, and some wonderful people, as I'm sure you've been finding out. Wonderful. Thank you. You've listened to Deep Pockets by Petro Söderling. To subscribe to content and to pre-order the book Governments and Innovation, The Economic Developer's Guide to Our Future, please go to petrasoderling.com. The wonderful music you heard is by Leroy Jones, an iconic New Orleans Jazz Hall of Fame trumpetist. You can find this and other Leroy Jones tunes at your favorite online or offline music store. Thanks for listening, and be sure to subscribe, like, rate, and share our episodes. It means a lot to me. Thank you.